All right, let's start with the recap of what we have already talked about in terms of gradient-based highlights or inter input attribution or saliency maps, however we like to call these methods. So um, our approach was to compute the gradient of some output function. We said it had to be a function that gives us a scalar value. And we have multiple options. We had in the lecture said, okay, let's go with the loss with the uh, top uh, prediction as the ground true class. And uh, we are going to use that as an our output function. And we are going to compute the gradient of that function with respect to a feature, which is in NLP, a token uh, embedding. A uh, gradient of a function that goes from n-dimensional space to a scalar value will give us um, a vector, n-dimensional vector. So because we wanted to have one important score, we had to turn that vector into a number in mean, a single, single scalar. And in the lecture, I said we could do dot product with the embedding. And then finally, we also normalized uh, all the scores we got for each token embedding uh, with respect to the scores of all other tokens in this sentence to get relative importance. Um, this was one recipe for how to compute gradient-based highlights. Um, then in the discussion in the paper we have uh, read, will you find these shortcuts? We have seen that actually, you know, it's not really necessarily the case that this, this recipe will work for any data set or any model. So there we have seen that actually, instead of the, taking dot product with the embedding, we could have taken the uh, L2 norm and that works in some cases better. So um, have that have that in mind that um, basically these are hyperparameters that you need to figure out for your specific data and uh, and the task. And actually, in your uh, homework assignment, I told you to look into how the integrated gradients are, um, you know, implemented in the uh, library you're going to use. And it's not exactly that uh, the case that they have used uh, this uh, procedure. But this is uh, this is one approach. Um, um, for which kind of models we can use this? Basically, for any differentiable model, as long as we can use a, you know computer derivative a gradient, uh, we are good to go. Um, then, in terms of plausibility, we didn't have said much yet or anything at all. We did say a little bit about faithfulness. So, in the paper, we have all read. Um, we we have seen one method to uh, test the faithfulness of of uh, the gradient based highlights. Um, that method uh, had um, trained a model that uses data shortcuts. We have said and learned that data shortcuts are these spurious correlations that exist in our training data uh, that did not exist in the real world occurrence of that data. Um, so our models can have really high accuracy, but for really bad reasons. For example, uh, we have talked about uh, how NLI models can uh, just figure out whether a word cat occurs in a sentence sentence called hypothesis, and based on that, uh, determine the relationship of that hypothesis with a, another sentence without ever reading that other sentence, which is of course, uh, totally meaningless uh, way of solving an NLI task. So uh, people like us who are developing these tools, when we are training a model, we would like to know whether it is doing uh, the task for the right reasons and um, gradient based highlights or other ways of doing input attribution could help us, um, uh, help us uh, to figure that out by highlighting those data shortcuts. Um, and this paper record kind of grounds their uh, protocol in that use case, uh, but they um, say something important, and that is that um, if we have a model that is uh, that is using data shortcuts and they train it in that way, then we can check whether the input attribution method is actually highlighting and revealing those data shortcuts. If it's not, then we know that it's not faithful uh, to the model uh, way, model's way of solving the task because we do know that the model uses those data shortcuts because we have trained it to use data shortcuts. Um, 
So that's one uh, one way of testing our uh, input attribution. Uh, the other paper that was presented uh, last time also talked about sanity checks. Sanity checks are kind of have the flavor of those uh, faithfulness tests that we had for chain of thoughts, uh, where you are proposing some tests that must be uh, fulfilled if the um, if your explainability method is uh, faithful to the model's way of uh, doing the task. And here they propose two tasks. One is to uh, randomly label your data. So you have your proper labels. If you have an image of a cat, you have a label of cat. If you have an image of a dog, you have a label dog. But here you just randomly permute them such that the association between the input and output doesn't have any sense anymore. And you are then going to see whether your highlights are going to change. If they do not change, if for uh, the original label and for, for the per third label, the model is predicting this, uh, sorry, the, not the model, but the gradient-based highlight is giving you exactly the same uh, visualizations, then that's fishy because the visualization should depend on the, on the appropriate label. Is similarly, if we can replace our trained weights with our random weights, and that should also give us different highlights because highlights should be dependent on the model weights. Um, and, and here in this paper, we have seen that actually those gradient-based highlights do not depend on the order, whether the, the label is properly labeled, neither on whether the we are computing the gradients with respect to the learned weights uh, or the random weights, which is which is bad. And there are some other faithfulness uh, measures that I want to talk about uh, today. In terms of utility, um, I think we touched on one utility, and that's finding shortcuts for people who are building these tools and want to know whether their models are using these spurious correlations. But um, you know, we didn't really talk about this in a sense of using actual developers of these models and uh, you know having a group of them who uses these highlights and group of them who does, does not uh, use the highlights and then comparing their um, you know effectiveness in uh, in finding uh, whether their model is uh, buggy in or not. Uh, so we'll talk more about this later later in the course, and I want to repeat this, and I'm going to keep repeating this, that what we didn't do is we didn't show a few saliency maps of highlights and said, well, look, this looks really neat and kind of matches our intuition. Uh, that's simply not acceptable anymore if you are uh, using these kinds of uh, methods. All right, so I'm going to move on to the to more more aspects of our evaluation so i said that we didn't say anything about the plausibility of these gradient based highlights um so um let's see how we can check whether our highlights are satisfactory in terms of whether they match what a person would say is the important part of the input um for the for the prediction so to do that, we will first need to turn our scores for every single token uh, into something that's more like a binary variable, where we're going to basically select some percentage of input tokens as important and everything else as not important. So um, given that you have computed the important scores of each token, you can rank them, and then you can take top 10% or top 20% as your important tokens. Once you have done that, um, basically, you can you don't need a gradient of highlights. You know, when we are visualizing these things, you can just color the words that kind of survived this um, important selection and uh, not color the words that did not. Once we do that, we can uh, do the following. We can do exact match F1 score with our human annotated highlights. So we will have for the data set, for our evaluation data set, annotations where actual people had said, okay, these are important phrases to predict that this is, um, you know, to, to say that um, the model should predict this, uh, this label. Um, so here we can just check whether our highlights are matching the human highlight one, you know, exactly. And then if they do, we say, okay, for this example, the human and model highlights are met totally matched uh, and zero otherwise, 
And then we, for every evaluation example, we will have one or zero, and we can then compute the F1 score as if we were working with, you know, a classification task. Um, the problem with this is that it's quite strict. People also don't disagree with uh, the exact spans uh, which are uh, important. So uh, we want something a little bit more relaxed. In uh, vision especially, you will see intersection over union F1 uh, score where uh, IOU is the size of the overlap of the token uh, positions, both human and model highlights deem important divided by the size of their union. So here um, it would be better if I said have said uh, not tokens, but rather features. So um, uh, for example, if you had pixels, you would do the same. You will measure the size of the overlap of the pixels, both the model and the person had said are uh, important and then divide by the number of all the pixels in the image. And then again, uh, you would say, okay, model highlight is plausible. Uh, if it uh, overlaps with any of the available human highlights by more than some threshold, let's say 50%. And if so, then for that evaluation example, you would assign a you know, one and otherwise you would assign a zero and you would report a F1 score across the entire evaluation set. And similarly in spirit, you can have a token level F1 score between human and model highlighted token positions. This is... Um, this is especially common in NLP because um, totally um, beyond the the whole thing with human highlights and explainability and whatever, there are tasks in NLP with, where we generate, uh, let's say uh, we have a question answering task where the goal is to find a span in some text that answers that question. And uh, this kind of stems from that. So basically what we do here, um, we, we calculate token precision, which is a fraction of model highlights that are deemed important by a human. That is, that also occur in a human authored highlights. Uh, and then we would calculate token recall, which is a fraction of human highlights that are also selected uh, by a model as important. And you, as always, calculate F1 as a harmonic mean uh, with, between uh, token precision and uh, recall. I don't know why there is any concern here, uh, but yeah, let's move on. So that's all about plausibility. Um, you have multiple options here. And then for uh, faithfulness, I have said that we have seen that method in the paper we all read. Uh, but I want to go over some more common uh, methods to measure faithfulness that are mentioned in that paper as well. And the most common ones are so-called fidelity metrics, which are a pair of two metrics. One is sufficiency and the other one is comprehensiveness. And if you have high sufficiency and high comprehensiveness together, then you can say, well, I deem my model highlight to be highly faithful. So what is comprehensiveness? Comprehensiveness uh, is measured uh, with this uh, equation. Uh, M stands for the probability of the predicted class uh, J. So given the entire input Xi, you have certain probability for your predicted class. And then from that probability, you are going to subtract the probability for that same class if uh, you didn't have um, if you if you strip the um, highlighted tokens from the inputs, uh, so that's that's what I said. And the idea is if your if your uh, is that uh, if your model is using only the highlighted tokens, um, then uh, this uh, difference here should be really large. Because if we didn't see the highlighted tokens denoted by Ri here, then it's going to predict something completely uh, different than uh, if it if uh, if it had seen them. Um, so this difference is going to be uh, really high. Um, and, and let me show you an example of comprehensive and not comprehensive uh, highlights. So, or what could be comprehensive and co not comprehensive highlights. So in the first example, uh, first we have in yellow, 
something that is uh, responsible for the prediction or you know in this paper we kind of uh, deem that this could be important for the prediction so extraordinarily horrendous is obviously suggestive that the label is negative and what comprehensiveness says okay now remove what you have highlighted from the input uh, and see whether you still can predict uh, the uh, original label, which is a negative. And here, let's let's see what's left. We have this film is, and I'm not going to waste any more words on it. That's kind of suggestive that this could be a negative movie review, right? If you're not going to waste words on it, that that's that's not good. So this would be an example of uh, a highlight that's not comprehensive because something beyond it in the input can suggest what the label uh, is. As I said, this is just an exercise to think about these things. It's not uh, really um, to, to really measure whether it's comprehensive or not. We need model probabilities, which we don't have here. Um, and then for the example of a, what could be a comprehensive highlight, uh, here we had um, have uh, uh, removed some of these highlighted phrases. And then um, if you read what's left, it's kind of mixed and it's hard to determine what exactly uh, is the sentiment here. So we have um, uh, some people make a likable try of protagonists, but they are just about the only palatable element of the mod squad of the 70s TV show. Um, story, well, it would be if you could decipher it, the character, several blank slates, and Scott Silver's perfection and reaction sequences are sheer force of talent, kind of now positive. Um, the three actors bring uh, marginal enjoyment from the proceedings whenever they are on screen, but the most squad is just with the first rate cast. So there are, you know, it's kind of sounding negative, but there are enough positive phrases here that um, it would be probably the probability of negative label would be significantly changed here. It, mm, if the model is well calibrated, then um, if it had seen the entire uh, review, it would probably have the highest, pro high, very high probability of the negative uh, review. But uh, with these uh, phrases strip here, that probability should uh, be be lower if the model is well calibrated. All right, so we said we need high comprehensiveness, and that's what we have. Uh, and now we also need high sufficiency. Um, and bear with me now, it's going to be a little bit uh, tricky how I'm going to explain this, because uh, first I will I will show you uh, that we want to compute low sufficiency, and then I will going to re um redefine sufficiency such that low sufficiency becomes high sufficiency so um all right so here we have uh, the again the probability for the predicted class when we have the entire input xi and now we subtract from that value the probability uh, of that same predicted class j when instead of the entire input we are giving only the highlighted tokens and if highlighted tokens are important for the prediction, and not only that, we want them to uh, be the reason why the model had predicted the label, then this difference uh, should, uh, then um, these two values should be basically the same. So when we subtract one from the other, we get a very low number. Um, so yeah, with this definition of sufficiency, having very low sufficiency is what is wanted, but it's kind of strange to say we want low sufficiency um, if um, we we want sufficiency. So uh, to make kind of a discussion about this easier, Carter et al. in 2020 had suggested to take an inverse of this, uh, uh, such that high value of this metric means a high uh, sufficiency. Uh, which is uh, which is kind of makes the whole um, you know um, presentation of what we want here easier, where we can say high sufficiency and high comprehensiveness highlights uh, give us highly faithful uh, highlights. Um, that's it here. Um, we could have taken an inverse only if we have bounded this uh, this value between um, zero and one. 
And that's what uh, Carton et al. Uh, suggest also to do in their paper uh, with these, uh, this equation, this one and this one, the values we are getting are not going to be bounded between zero and one. And to bow them between zero and one, they just suggest to, uh, you know, um, basically if the if you get value that's lower uh, than zero, you, you cap it to zero. Uh, besides doing that, besides bounding in between zero and one, they also um, they are, they are also proposing a normalization technique, um, and the reason for this is because different data sets have different um, not biases in a in a negative sense, but rather like properties. So they could be very imbalanced, for example, and also models themselves can be very widely uh, differently calibrated. So in this paper, they bring that observation and they say that that will have the influence on these uh, sufficiency and comprehensiveness metrics. And they give an a, a example of a data set where you have um, different Wikipedia edits and some of them are, um, some of them uh, exhibit uh, some kind of attack on the side of the, uh, person on who's doing the editing uh, in Wikipedia. Um, so basically the task is uh, there is a presence of a personal attack or there is no presence of a personal attack in the data set. There are way more examples uh, without a personal attack and there are few examples with a personal attack. So this is an imbalanced data set. And more so when there is no attack, if you predict no attack is happening here, the best highlight is actually to not highlight anything because the absence of the attacking words is why you are predicting no attack in this example. So um, um, doing that, just predicting no attack and not highlighting anything would give you really high sufficiency already. Um, so they, they recognize that and they say, well, you know, if we don't do anything, then that kind of seems like, oh, this method is really great for this data set because uh, it has really, really high sufficiency, uh, which is not the case. They say, okay, instead of doing that, we should normalize sufficiency with, respe with respect to the sufficiency we get when we do not highlight anything, uh, which is denoted with zero here. And um, similarly, they say also when we are measuring comprehensiveness, we should measure comprehensiveness with respect to comprehensiveness we get if we use everything uh, in the input. So uh, when you are evaluating your highlighting method with sufficiency and comprehensiveness, when you're evaluating its faithfulness, um, you should be using this normalized uh, sufficiency and comprehensiveness. Uh, I'm emphasizing this because this kind of work has been overlooked a little bit, I would say, and these are very important points. So if I was reviewing your paper and you have not produced normalized sufficiency and comprehensiveness, um, I would probably ask you, hey, I mean, in the light of this paper, I don't know whether your interpretations from your work uh, have some, um, you know, confounders, and why didn't you use the method that is more superior? So definitely use this normalized version of uh, versions of sufficiency and comprehensiveness. All right, so to recap, um, we have now introduced another measure of uh, measuring faithfulness. Um, and um, this measure is composed actually of two Submetrics: one is sufficiency, other one is comprehensiveness. And we have said if sufficiency is high, then highlighted tokens alone are enough for the model to predict the label, which is good because that's that's exactly what we want, right? We want um, if we are showing certain tokens and saying this is the reason why the model predicts uh, this label, then these tokens alone should be indicative of the label. And we also said, okay, we want comprehensiveness to be high. And that means that tokens that are not highlighted are not going to help the model to predict the label. So what does these two thing, these two metrics, high sufficiency, high comprehensiveness together mean? It says 
tokens can predict the label and nothing outside of the tokens can help the model predict the label. So that makes a strong case that those tokens that we have highlighted are, are why the model had predicted uh, the label. However, that said, there is um, something that could be happening happening here that is unwanted, specifically about this idea that you have erased something from the input or replaced it with mass tokens or whatever other tokens. Um, now, when we do that, when we erase them or uh, replace them with something else, if that changes the model output highly, we, we deem that that's because those tokens were important. And this other work, uh, which I will be referring as ROAR, say, well, you know, there are two things that might be happening when we uh, raise tokens from the input. Um, okay, excuse me, this is just what I, what I said uh, before. Um, so if we remove the tokens from the input, and then we see observe high difference in the probabilities for the originally predicted class. Well, it could be those tokens are really important and without them, the model can't predict the class label uh, anymore. Or we maybe introduce data shift because if we had replaced those tokens with some other tokens that don't, don't ex you know, are not seeing enough, or maybe we strip them and now produce very weird, maybe not even readable uh, text or with images if we had replaced them with uh, black pixels. Now these new new images, new text that we are producing are different than, um, than um, what we have seen, what the model has seen during the training. And uh, what uh, authors of ROAR are suge suggesting, well, then we should retrain the model with incomplete inputs and uh, repeat the evaluation, you know, give the incomplete inputs and see whether uh, the, the prediction, pro whether the probability of the predicted label is changed notably with respect to the probability we will get with the complete uh, inputs. And if still we are seeing that drop, then we are more confident that this drop is not because of the data shift, because now the model has seen these incomplete examples. It is because these things were really important. And then suggesting not only doing that, but also comparing the drop uh, to the drop we would get if we randomly sampled uh, some tokens. And your drop that you get or change that you get uh, by removing your important tokens should be higher than if we had removed any random tokens. Uh, so how, how does this uh, then look like? Again, um, uh, remember when I talked about plausibility, I said you need to choose the percentage of tokens you are going to select as important and those that are not going to be important. Um, that's also necessary both for sufficiency and um, comprehensiveness, as well as with this uh, ROAR approach. So on the x-axis, we have the percentage of input features uh, that are deemed important, that we select as important. And on the uh, i-axis, we have test uh, accuracy. Uh, so if we do not retrain our model with incomplete inputs, we have the following picture. Uh, these dashed lines here are three different uh, gradient-based methods, and we have our random method here. So all of our gradient-based uh, highlighting had selected tokens that, once removed, have changed the test accuracy, uh, specifically have made the uh, have resulted in a drop in accuracy that's more notable than if we had removed random tokens, which is uh, which is good. This is what we want, especially in this uh, regime here where we are selecting just a few tokens. However, uh, when they have retrained uh, the model with their incomplete uh, images or different images that have patches of, of black pixels, we have a different picture, right? Here we have in gray, again, our random baseline, and actually, all of the uh, gradient attribution methods are above it, which is unwanted. So 
um, this this shows that it actually was the case that the these uh, newly uh, constructed images are out of domain to the model. However, there is another thing that might be happening here. So uh, follow up to ROAR is a recursive ROAR that says, well, uh, the problem here might be that there are some uh, data set redundancies. Uh, for example, they say if two tokens are equally relevant, but only one of them is identified as important, ROAR fails to remove the, the second token. So what do they mean by that? So here uh, you have a ROAR by the paper we have just uh, gone over. And we have the review, the movie is great. I really liked it. And uh, the higher you know, the intensity of a highlight here, the more important the word is. Uh, what ROAR does is uh, it first masks 10% of the tokens because this is a really short sentence. It's going to mask only the, the most important one, the movies mask, I really liked it. And then it's going to check the change in the accuracy. However, because this other word liked here um, is not mask, the model can still uh, predict that this is a positive movie review. And um, yeah, so I, what I want to also emphasize here, you, you might be wondering now, well, you know, liked wasn't the second important word, so it's not a problem of roar, it's the problem of the model that, you know, doesn't put enough emphasis on like uh, as it should or and so on. Um, I think the point here is that the model doesn't need to put as much emphasis on liked if it had already seen great. So you know, um, this word becomes slightly less important given the huge importance of, of uh, great. Um, so what the, the, this paper um, is suggesting is to recompute your input attribution when you mask certain tokens. So in the first iteration of ROAR, we have mask 10%, which uh, is only one token. Then you recompute the gradient attribution. And now, yeah, like this really, really important word. Uh, so you are going to mask liked in the next iteration of ROAR. And then uh, you are going to see a notable change uh, in the accuracy, which then uh, shows that both the gradient attribution is fine and the model is, is doing the task well. Um, so yeah, basically, if, not, if it wasn't clear what the change is here, we do everything we did with ROAR, except that we, at, uh, at every stage uh, of, uh, you know, when we are masking certain percent of the tokens, we recompute the uh, attribution. All right, so besides that, they also produced a single metric to, to you um, to kind of quantify the things we have been um, observing from the plots where we had a line that corresponds to a randomly picked tokens and to tokens that have been selected by some uh, attribution method. Uh, before, you know, I would say, okay, the random line here in pink is above the red line, which corresponds to attribution, and that's good. And we want to see uh, that this gap between them is uh, as big as possible. Well, instead of saying all those words, they say we could quantify, quantify that by basically what they do here is they take whatever is the lowest uh, accuracy here that we get. Um, that's going to be kind of the bottom line. And then uh, the value we get uh, at a certain percentage step with our random uh, method is going to be like an upper bound. And the difference between those two will be called bi. And then the difference uh, between, uh, between uh, the attribution method and the, uh, and the random baseline is going to be PI. And then you can um, just um, measure the ratio between PIs and BIs uh, is kind of what we are doing here. All right, so yeah, this is this is a kind of another metric we could use 
not kind of, this is another metric we can use to measure uh, faithfulness. Uh, and to recap, to do that is quite computational intensive, so be prepared for that. Uh, you will have uh, different uh, percentages of tokens uh, masked. And um, at each percentage of tokens, you are going to recompute the gradient attribution, and then you are going to measure how the accuracy or probability of the predicted class change, and uh, you are going to ground that change into how much it would change if we had mask random tokens. And you're going to then report this metric called RACU. OK, so basically, this brings us at, to the end of, of the um, gradient-based highlights and input attribution, almost. Um, at least it kind of uh, completes this uh, picture here. So I won't repeat everything I said before. I will repeat that not not repeat but add that uh, we now have plausibility evaluation. We have said that for that we need a data set with human authored um, highlights, and again, again uh, as with free text explanations, we have plenty of those. You can go to the same website I have mentioned before, explain X NLP data sets, uh, where you have a ton of those uh, there. And you're going to uh, see what your model is highlighting, see what your people have highlighted and compare, uh, basically measure the overlap between those highlights. And for faithfulness between two methods we have seen before, we have also now learned that we can measure normalized sufficiency and comprehensiveness, that both of those should be high for the model to highlights to be faithful. And then we have seen a sequence of <laughs> excuse me, faithfulness methods that build on the concept of uh, erasure, which is very similar to sufficiency as well, and that brought us to the final method, recursive Aurora. <laughs>